there's a little choreography involved, so do bear with us as we switch between webcam and video here and there. So over to David. Let's see if we can do this. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am David Peace, the man with the motor neuron disease, the funny face and the funny voice. You are not listening to me speaking live, because, thanks to the illness, I cannot speak. The voice you hear is the product of specialist software and work by speech scientists. I was tasked with recording almost 2,000 phrases just before my voice disappeared. Those recordings were broken down before being reconstructed into a database from which I can do text-to-speech using my iPad. I do not think it sounds like me but it is the best the techies can do in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. For this discussion I have typed out and recorded a few statements and I will try to fit them in as appropriate. I hope you can understand me. This is me in summary today. I am 73 years old, an alumnus of three universities, in good health until two years ago, and still mentally active. Motor neuron disease, also called ALS. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, can start in different parts of the body, in effect paralyzing those muscles, and then spreading everywhere, paralyzing as it goes. The brain sends its normal messages to move muscles, but the messages do not get through. No one seems to know what causes it, or how it can be prevented, treated, Cured. My condition was first diagnosed as bulbar palsy before being confirmed as MND. The brainstem, also known as the bulbar region, controls the muscles needed for swallowing, speaking, chewing, and other functions. Mine started in my mouth, with some pronunciation difficulties. It is spreading to the neck and throat, and it will take over the whole of my body. As of today, despite all the research, it cannot be stopped. It's terminal. My day-to-day -day life is much reduced, and it will reduce further until I die, possibly when the lungs stop working, or if I choke. Or, I can take action myself. Um, yeah, we thought it would be helpful now to put David's current situation in the context of his past life. So let's hear a brief summary of, of his past 50 years. My life has been pretty adventurous, traveling from a working class background to a world class university, Cambridge, to read class 6, Latin, Greek and ancient history, then on to do charity work in the Sudan followed by work in an oil camp in the Libyan Sahara, moving on to Saudi Arabia for 11 years. I ran a military college supporting the Air Force. Back to Britain aged 40, I did an MBA and became Director of Management Development for two global organizations, British Aerospace and Tarmac followed by some years as a consultant providing career and performance support for executives and others, and then for almost 20 years, back to volunteering, including into Cambridge alumni organizations, as secretary and president of my college's alumni society, and as chair of the university's alumni society in London, both very busy jobs. Then the diagnosis for M. Andy, and my world changed. Um, I suggest we learn a little more about how M. Andy is actually affecting David. This is how it is affecting me now, two years after the first problems, and 18 months after the diagnosis. The tongue and lips, and mouth, and throat muscles do not work, 
So after an operation in November 2020, I now feed myself by syringing special liquid nutrition through an external tube straight into my stomach, because the tongue cannot move, and the lips have no strength, there is no control over saliva, which floods the mouth, and pours out at times. Other liquids settle in the throat. Coughing leads to choking. The MND is spreading. The neck muscles are very weak, so I can't hold my head up for more than a few minutes. The balance is a bit shaky, so if I go out I take a walking stick and use a rather uncomfortable neck brace to keep the head up. Going out means being accompanied, because without speech it would be very difficult to deal with any situation. And in the further complication of a pandemic, I mainly stay at home, with help from Tim when needed. Unless there is a sudden dramatic research breakthrough, my future prospects are guaranteed. I will become increasingly paralyzed throughout my whole body until I die. That might take another year, perhaps a little more perhaps less. For me, the process will be intolerable. More about that later. Um, just before we go on, can I just check that everyone can hear uh, what we've recorded for David? Yes. Yes, that's okay. Thank you. Maybe no idea if you can tell us how, uh, how he's spending the days uh, uh, in these in these days times. I think Minji, could you possibly mute everyone? We're getting some feedback just from some some. Um... So I muted everyone. Great. Um, okay, so uh, on to David to see how he's spending mm. spending his days. The body is suffering, but so far the brain is working reasonably well. Last year, knowing that my future life would be short, I started a blog. It is multi-purpose. It tells stories of my past, it comments on some current events, and it tracks the motor neuron disease as it moves through me on its deadly way. The blog seems to have attracted a wide audience. It is often humorous and light-hearted and of course serious, and I hope it will help others who suffer. It certainly keeps me stimulated, writing frequent blog entries, and handling correspondence. We are here because Minji saw my blog and found it interesting because it is a mixture of past life stories, current suffering, and future prospects. I would love to be able to tell you stories from the blog but I cannot with this voice. So you are invited to read it. How did I get a friend out of prison in Saudi Arabia? What about the private chat with Mohammed Ali when he was world champion? And the story of my work colleague, a German ex-Nazi SS officer in the middle of the Sahara? How did I lose my clothes just before the Queen's garden party? Am I really a lord? The undercover activities with the security services. How did I send more than a hundred people to prison without trial? The disaster in the car wash. Affairs of the heart. And how am I tackling this terrible illness? All in the blog, and much more. To read these stories, and more, you can visit the blog at www.deardavid.co. UK. Um, in, in case any of you missed the website address, uh, Minji will post the link in the chat box so you can all see it uh, later. Um, other links that may come up later will also be posted there. And for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, Minji will add the links into the description box which can be found underneath the YouTube video. Just a David. comment, David. Didn't know you were James Bond. Double O seven. That's right. <laughs> that I can read. <laughs> uh, 
Well, that's fantastic story so far. Thank you. Uh, um, David, you're now trying to raise money to help uh, research and the MNDA. Um, can you tell us a little about how that came about? In November 2020, my friend Professor Tony Watts suggested that he open a fund in my name with the Motor Neuron Disease Association to support research. I agreed, so the David Peace Fund was launched on the 2nd of December. It now features in the blog, and it is promoted wherever we can find an audience. Currently it has raised over £14,000 to support research into this cruel illness. I think the total is actually nearly £15,000 now, and it must be said we're all hugely thankful for the generosity of all those who have donated so far. Each pound, dollar or euro donated makes a real difference. But more about the fund later. Now, talking of research, in January, you may have read in the papers about a breakthrough in MND research. Dr. Arpan Mehta and his team at the Ewan MacDonald Centre in Edinburgh have been investigating something that could lead to a slowing down of the damage caused by MND. As is often the case, the research is at a very early stage, but the future is hopeful. At this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Brian Dickey, Director of Research Development at the Motor Neuron Disease Association, to contextualise this new research to explain more about what the MNDA does and the future landscape of MND research. So over to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak today. I'm going to try and share my slides with you uh, if I can find the right presentation. If somebody could put the thumbs up when it comes up, that would be fantastic. Excellent. <laughs> So yes, I'm the research director with the Motor Neuron Disease Association. I should say the Motor Neuron Disease Association of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, because the Scots have their own organization. And indeed there are many uh, organizations, patient associations around the world. Um, I thought I'd start with a few facts and figures to complement uh, David's frank and emotive description of what is a really devastating disease. So, um, Motor neuron disease is actually a bit of an umbrella term. It does uh, cover a number of related conditions, but over 90% of cases are a particular form called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And the terms are often used interchangeably. So over in North America, for example, they will very much use the term ALS to describe all forms of MND. It's progressive it's often brutally progressive. Um, Stephen Hawking, who's pictured in this slide, is very much the exception in terms of survival. He lived with uh, this disease for over 50 years, but the reality is a third will die within a year of diagnosis and 50% within two years. It's, it's considered rare. It comes under the um, umbrella of what are called orphan diseases. But uh, actually, the incidence is in the same ballpark as multiple sclerosis. Um, where it different, differs from multiple sclerosis, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, is in prevalence, the number of people alive at any one time. And the reason for that, of course, is because of this high mortality in MND. So there are 40 times more people with multiple sclerosis living at any one time than have motor neuron disease because of the progressive terminal nature of the disease. To try and put it in uh, another way, the lifetime risk of developing MND, certainly in the UK, is about one in 300. And that, that basically means that there are 200,000 people within the current UK population who will receive a diagnosis of motor neuron disease. So suddenly it maybe doesn't sound quite so rare after all. Um, I do need to add that there is a family history in at least 10% of cases, and that's quite relevant to what I'm going to go on to talk about. So the MND Association has kind of three strategic activities, uh, care and support for people with MND, research, and then the campaigning and awareness raising. Um, I'm going to focus very much on the research today. Uh, we've funded research since the organization was founded uh, 40 years ago 
and we're currently supporting more research studies than any other UK funder. And most of our funding is spent in the UK uh, and also the Irish Republic, but we also try and seed collaborations with other labs around the world, because in the rare disease arena, collaboration is absolutely essential. And what we want to see is new knowledge and expertise being imported into the UK to help build up the UK research base. And partnership and collaboration is absolutely essential. We might be a fairly large player in the MND research world, but in terms of medical research funding, it really is a drop in the ocean. And so a core philosophy is to work with others where we can, not only through joint funding initiatives, but also in building the underpinning infrastructure. This can be anything from DNA banks to cell banks to clinical research networks. Um, and also very importantly in communicating the outcomes of all this research activity, not just to the specialist audiences, but to patients and public as well. And I quite like this picture uh, on the right hand side. We organize uh, the world's largest scientific and medical meeting uh, every year on the disease. And uh, this was a couple of years ago when I uh, sneaked onto the edge of the platform as one of the speakers was um, talking about some of the big gene hunting collaborations, just to take a photograph of, uh, well, very nice uh, of him in silhouette. That's Professor Amar al Chalabi, but also just the number of organizations that were involved in funding this research. You know, I have a phrase joined up thinking, joined up funding. If we expect the researchers around the world to work together, then the supporting organizations, the charities, the government bodies have to work together as well. So, uh, you know, these diseases are tough nuts to crack. There's no getting away from the fact that age related neurodegeneration has unfortunately um, been very unsuccessful in turning knowledge into treatments. And MND isn't uh, alone in that. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, it's been incredibly challenging. They're highly complex diseases, but there are encouraging signs of progress. Um, and they've actually taken MND research from what was a relative scientific backwater 20 years ago, very much to the forefront of neurodegenerative disease research. And over the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to highlight some of the reasons why. The first is that we're seeing almost exponential growth in international research activity. So this graph here, uh, there's three lines you can see. The red line shows the number of scientific and medical research papers that have been published in MND since just after the war. And you can see that for years, for decades, it bumps along the bottom. But in recent years, it's really shot up. Now, just for comparison, I've added two other rare neurodegenerative, progressive neurodegenerative diseases, Huntington's disease, which I'm sure um, you've heard of, one which you may not have heard of called progressive supranuclear palsy. And you can see that everything's rising. There's more research going on than ever before, but there's something about MND or ALS that's really grabbed the attention of the international research community. And that is really being driven by research into understanding the genetic component of this disease. And this little insert graph here shows over the past 20, 25 years, the number of genes that have been discovered that are linked to this disease. MND is a complex disease. It involves genetic predisposition, exposure to environmental factors over years, over decades, that finally tilts the balance in the, uh, of the disease occurring. But this is starting to give us an insight. Identifying these genetic components that prime the disease are helping us to really understand what's going on in sick and dying motor neurons. And it's generating a massive amount of knowledge on what's happening within the central nervous system of somebody living with MND. But what we need to, I don't have time to go through all the various uh, aspects, as you can see, it's, this is why we have um, conferences every year on this, but we do need to try and unpick uh, what is a cause of the disease, and what is a consequence of the disease. And in order to work out 
which events occur in which order. Uh, to try and uh, use an analogy, I liken this as MND a bit like a river that flows out to the sea. Just like a river has many, many different sources that form tributaries that come together into the final common pathway that leads out to the sea. So we're discovering many, many of these effectively causes of the disease, particularly in the inherited cases in the families. And we can take this knowledge into the lab and we can start to build up a map of what's going on within the central nervous system. And as you build that up that map, you start to identify the key points where the tributaries meet. You know, this is a bit of a simplification, but it's, you know, it's identifying the pivotal processes that determine life or death for a motor neuron. So um, Tim mentioned the um, results from Edinburgh University recently. So I thought I'd just say a little bit about that. What they have done is they've identified um, a couple of these points where the tributaries meet. And um, part of it's related to the way that cells produce and use energy. And there appears to be something dysfunctional going on within those nerve cells. Um, and the other thing is that motor neurons are incredibly long, thin cells, the longest cells in the body. They can be up to a meter in length, and yet they can be a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. So incredible long, thin structures. And it appears that the energy deficit is actually causing a deficit in the structure of these nerve cells and in the way they manage to transport essential nutrients up and down the body. Um, so this is actually Dr. Mehta who was uh, mentioned. He sat there with Ewan McDonald, who is a, um, a gentleman with uh, motor neuron disease and whose family provided a lot of funding to establish the Ewan McDonald MND Center up at Edinburgh University. And this is the name of the paper that they published um, back in uh, the end of January. And I, I don't have time to go into the um, details of it, but you can see it's a pretty technical title to that research paper. Um, what I actually wanna focus on isn't so much the science here, but about how science is reported by the media, because this, was certainly an advance in understanding the disease. And what ourselves and Edinburgh University did was to try and promote this, turn it into plain English and explain what it meant. And, you know, Edinburgh produced a news release. We produced a, a blog posting as well. And you can see the language that's being used there, you know, exciting, potential, um, a target for, treatments. Um, you know, it was cautious optimism. Then the mainstream media gets hold of it. And bang, you know, caution goes out the window. Um, you could almost play hyperbole bingo here. How many times is breakthrough used, game changer discovery, massive discovery. And of course, this leads to people with MND um, contacting not just the researchers, but the MND association as well. Um, anticipating that there's a trial that they can go on. And unfortunately, this is laboratory-based research. It's still several years away from the clinic. However, that said, it is an advance. I don't use the word breakthrough. A breakthrough is a pill that somebody can take that will slow or stop their disease. But um, certainly what they were trying to put across in the excitement was that maybe they could take a shortcut from the many, many years of drug discovery and development. And if they could find a treatment that was already on the market for another disease, maybe they could go straight or quicker into clinical trials. And this is a, a very active area at the moment. It's called the drug repurposing or drug recycling. You know, if there's a, a drug on the market for completely different disease, but the science in your disease has moved on and it suggests that there are common changes at work, then could you take a drug that's already been through 
that development process, which takes years and tens, hundreds of millions of pounds sometimes, and just go straight and do a clinical trial. So that's something that's really uh, risen out of cancer in recent years, but is certainly occurring uh, in MND. And I just highlight two uh, pan-European trials that we're involved in at the moment, which are using drugs that are already available on the market for different conditions. So one's called Myracals. It's using a drug that's used to treat certain types of cancer called interleukin-2. Um, I have to say interleukin-2 is a really nasty drug. You wouldn't want to use it unless you really had to. But the doses that we're using in uh, MND are about 2% uh, of the doses used in cancer. So thankfully, we're not seeing the side effect. And the other one is using a, a real tongue twister, a, a drug called terorazodeoxycholic acid, which is used for certain liver and gallbladder conditions. Um, and I just highlight the fact that um, because MND is quite a rare disease, you have to cast your net wide. You have to run these trials over several countries. Um, now, I don't want to get into the politics of Brexit, but you'll see the European Commission uh, logo down at the bottom there, because these are both largely funded by large European Commission grants. And these are absolutely essential because they provide funding that transcends national boundaries. Whereas I'm afraid government funding tends to be quite parochial. It sits within the taxpayer um, boundaries. And even charities like ours, the way money is raised is often quite parochial as well. So it's a lot easier to raise money for London, England than it is to raise money for a project in London, Canada. So I'm just going to go back to my river because one of the other strategies that I think is a really exciting one, which is um, being pursued now is, well, where you've got these inherited forms of the disease, what if we actually tried to dam that river right upstream, right near the source? Uh, it would mean that it would only work for that particular cause of MND, but because you're trying to dam the river really far upstream, it might actually be more effective. And this is a, an approach called um, antisense, um, which basically, uh, you know, the, the simple premise is, if you've got a mutated gene, which is making a mutant protein, which is killing your cells, what if you just switched that gene off so that it couldn't do that? Or you at least turned it down like a dimmer switch so it was less active, could you slow down the disease? Could you potentially stop? Could you potentially reverse the disease? And uh, I've put up three um, dams there because these are the three genetic forms of MND where we currently have treatments um, in clinical trials. And, um, you know, one of the reasons for this excitement is, well, first of all, the early studies in MND patients are looking quite promising, but it comes actually, the excitement comes from a childhood motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is uh, caused by uh, a genetic mutation. And we've seen almost miraculous um, development of treatments in the past three or four years. First of all, a drug called Spinraza, which works using this antisense approach. But just last week, you may have noticed in the news, um, the announcement that uh, the NHS has agreed to fund um, this drug called Zolgensma, which is actually the world's most expensive drug. I think its list price is $1.79 million. <laughs> Massive amount of money, but you only hopefully have to give one dose of that drug and it works for life. So, um, you know, building on the success in these childhood motor neuron conditions, can we do the same thing, at least for some of these genetic forms of the disease? So um, the other reason for optimism is that MND, I think, can be treated and is being treated by many drug companies as, if you like, a model for neurodegeneration. And the philosophy is, if you can get it right for MND, even if it's a rare disease, you can then take those approaches 
and get it right for the bigger markets of Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. And one of the reasons that we're promoting MND as the model is first of all, the nature of this disease, the fact whoops, that it is progressive, often relentlessly progressive, but in terms of running a drug trial, that's actually what a drug company wants to see because then you can actually measure changes in disease progression. Um, we're developing new ways of predicting with increasing accuracy how the disease is likely to progress in an individual. Um, this graph on the top right here, this is actually the prognostic model for Stephen Hawking. It was published in the Lancet Neurology uh, about a year after he died. And what the researchers did was they took some information that would have been available at his time of diagnosis and applied it to this model. And they were able to predict just from that information at his diagnosis that he had a 94% chance of living at least 10 years. Whereas of course, when he was first diagnosed, he would have been told he had two years to live. And what this might mean is, well, it has implications for care planning, but it has implications for research in that in the future, patients might actually be able to be used as their own control rather than having to recruit large number of patients to take placebo or dummy pill. And it would mean that maybe everybody on a trial could actually get the potentially useful ingredient. There are huge advances being made in biomarkers. And by that, what I mean is something that tells us what's going on on the inside within the central nervous system, even if it's unclear what's happening on the outside in terms of changes of muscle strength, breathing, et cetera. Um, you know, it could be an MRI scan, it could be a blood test, it could be a test of cerebral spinal fluid. And we're starting to identify and develop these biomarkers that actually allows us to predict how people are likely to progress, whether it's slowly or quickly. And also, if we see changes in these biomarkers, it tells us the drug is actually hitting its target and having an impact on the inside. And then finally, we've been, uh, the MND world has been uh, really quick to take advantage of um, changes in the way clinical trials are run in cancer. Um, it's often said in MND that trials are like number 10 buses. Nothing happens for a couple of years, then two trials come along at once and then nothing happens again for another couple of years. And that's incredibly inefficient. Wouldn't it make more sense if we could actually have a conveyor belt of one trial after another coming along? And so these new, um, what are called multi-arm trial design uh, methods are coming on board. And we have one called MND Smart, which is being run through UK centers and another one called TriCals, which is actually international, mainly focused in Europe, but Australia and Canada are also involved as well. So, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, exciting things happening in the MND research world, but I will reiterate that this is a complex disease and it's not like the way the media portrays science. You know, I often say that uh, the media treats science like an episode of Star Trek. And in the last five minutes of the program, somebody snaps their finger and says, well, why don't we reverse the dilithium flow through the phase energizer, Captain? It always sounds better in a Scottish accent as well. And then the last five seconds of the program, the ship saved from blowing up. You know, that's how the media portrays research. That's how the public perceives research. In reality, of course, it's a lot more messy than that. It's a long, torturous process of hypothesis and experimentation, literally of trial and error. But, you know, I, I am confident that we are starting to move in the right direction. And uh, I'll end with a bit of a kind of mixed metaphor cliche and say that, you know, we might not see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel yet, but the train is heading in the right direction and it's picking up speed. So thank you very much for listening and apologies if I went on a little bit long, Minji. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. I, I believe there's a question for you uh, from the audience that's particularly addressing, uh, that's a question from Maria. Uh, what part of the world is it most prevalent and what part of the world is it least? <laughs> right. 
Um, yeah, it's found everywhere in the world. And that's the first thing. Um, but there are areas where you see a higher incidence of disease. But there, you have to be a bit careful in how you look at this. So, for example, I remember um, sitting beside a South African neurologist at a, a meeting. Any of you that uh, are rugby fans will know the name Just van der Vesthuizen, who used to be the South Africa scrum half, who was diagnosed with MND. And uh, so I was sat with his neurologist one time and, and he said, you know, I, I don't really know much about MND because I am dealing virtually every hour of the day with the neurological consequences of HIV within the, the Zulu population. And, uh, you know, in countries like Africa, for example, where um, the life expectancy is shorter, then of course, you don't see such a high incidence of these age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or MND. So you always have to bear that in mind, but you will certainly find MND everywhere in the world. It doesn't discriminate in that respect. But there are some um, places, for example, in um, Northern Scandinavia, where there's a very high incidence of some of these genetic forms. And so that drives up the number of cases. And that comes, of course, from the fact that a lot of northern Scandinavian communities are very isolated. And over the course of many generations, cousins marry cousins. And if there's a gene prevalence in that population, it gets distributed around the population. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian. David and team, there are actually quite a few questions for David. Uh, do you want to address them now or would you like to save it for later? I think we'll, 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 we'll press ahead and, and if we have time, we'll, we'll address any more questions that we can. Right. Um, if that's okay. Um, and so, th well, thank you, Brian, by the way, and, and thank you for making yourself available for this talk and for everything that you're doing at the MNDA. Um, thank you for your support. Uh, let's now just hand back to, to David. Thank oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. As you know, I wrote this earlier. It was based on my understanding of the realities. So I hope what I now say does not conflict with the information you have just given. As I see it, there are three routes to the end of my life. Two of them I do not want. The MND will travel through the body, paralyzing as it goes. Already there is a pipe into my stomach for feeding. Later the lungs will weaken, and I will need mechanical ventilation. Firstly non-invasive, and then invasive, with a permanent pipe into the throat. As the arms and legs stop working I will be confined to a chair, or sofa, the bed, the wheelchair. I will need 24-hour care, and help with all the bodily functions. It may take a year or more before death comes. That period will be very upsetting for someone like me. And how I die could be very unpleasant. Naturally, I think about Professor Stephen Hawking. I admire him, but I have no intention of following his example. That route, I do not want. Here is another route. I have given written instructions to doctors and to those holding powers of attorney, stating that there are a number of invasive treatments I will not accept. Even if my life is in danger, the doctors must give me palliative care to allow me to die without those possibly invasive interventions. That way of death could also be unpleasant. The third route is what I want and what I have planned. Two days after the diagnosis in July 2019, I joined Dignitas the Swiss organization that arranges accompanied suicide. I found it to be excellent and highly moral. I provided papers and statements which satisfied Swiss law, and a year ago I was given the official green light to go there, 
at a date to be agreed to end my life. It is a simple matter of drinking or syringing in a liquid, but it's painless. One goes to sleep with death following some minutes later. In February 2020 I visited Zurich and met the doctor who will prescribe the liquid. It was very comforting. We have not arranged a date but my plan is to end my days there. The pandemic restrictions have interfered with that, but I hope those problems will disappear while I am still able to travel without too much difficulty. Dignitas is highly moral very decent. They give no encouragement to use their services. They do have to charge though, and for all the services, including the legal ones, and travel, it will cost me around £10,000. That is the route I want. I can afford it, but many cannot. In a better world there would be a fourth route. If Britain had a similar legal service it would be far easier and cheaper and I and others might even be able to die peacefully at home. Currently that's not available though. Well, um, it's not an easy subject for everyone to discuss. We're almost conditioned to think it's a subject we shouldn't talk about but that in itself must change regardless of what side you take. That leads us on to our next speaker, Leslie Mary Close. Leslie is a patron of Dignity in Dying, an organisation that campaigns for everybody's right to a good death, including the option of assisted dying for terminally ill, mentally competent adults. Leslie is a regular speaker for Dignity in Dying and became involved in the campaign as her brother John had MND, and in 2003 he became one of the first Britons who had an accompanied death in Switzerland. David and I have done a lot of reading on the subject, so I'm going to present Leslie with a few questions based on that reading. People may agree in principle with the idea of accompanied death, but many of the same arguments against it crop up time and time again. It seems to be one of those subjects that you have to work doubly hard to change what people think about it. In 2015, the last time the question was put to Parliament in the UK, MPs voted to reject the assisted dying bill. 85 MPs put compelling arguments for and against the bill, yet many of these arguments essentially go unchallenged, and they often cite problems that there are actually good and practical answers to. Fear and uncertainty of changes is much easier to propagate than change itself, especially concerning a matter that we've been conditioned not to feel comfortable talking about. Now, Leslie, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you told me that John's MND diagnosis came in March 2001 and it was actually a difficult diagnosis to get. Can you tell everyone how some of his symptoms were misinterpreted and, uh, and how soon after a proper diagnosis that he decided he wanted, ended it, wanted to end his life on his terms? Do that now, I'm unmuted, thank you. Could you just repeat the question? Uh, yes, am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, you told me that John's diagnosis came in March 2001, but it was actually a difficult diagnosis to get. Yes. Can you tell everyone how some of his symptoms were misinterpreted and, some, and how soon after a proper diagnosis he decided that he wanted to end his life on his own terms? Of course. It was probably about two years before diagnosis that John first noticed the symptoms. The muscle cramps he had in his legs were initially put down to overuse. He'd been a keen runner and cyclist. And it was thought that these were these, this, this muscle problem was simply the, relate, the, the result of having led an active life. At the same time, he was suffering some of what you described, David, the, the pronunciation problems and some difficulty with swallowing. And those things were put down to stress. He was in a very stressful job. He was also suffering a condition called emotional lability, where he was crying inappropriately in meetings. Lability is either crying or laughing. Sadly for John, it was crying. And he would find himself in a meeting at work and in floods of tears for no apparent reason. And these, this was put down to stress. And he was put on quinine for the, for the cramps and antidepressants for what was apparently stress. And then in early 2001, he developed 
a, a problem with a severe headache and some problems with his, his heart rate. And he went to the GP again, thinking it was stress, but he couldn't see his own doctor who he'd been seeing previously. He saw his then girlfriend's doctor who, who look, looked at him slightly differently and said he thought there was something else going on. And within a matter of a couple of weeks, he went, he went straight off to hospital then. Within a couple of weeks, he'd been told he had motor neurone disease. It was, um, it was confusing because he'd had so many different diagnoses in, in very recent days, very recent weeks and months. And then suddenly he had this one bringing together of the picture. That was March, 2001. In, January 2003, a gentleman called Reg Crew went to Dignitas, and that was the first the world, that the UK, sorry, knew about the existence of Dignitas. A, gen a previous um, Britain had gone in October 2002, but we didn't know very much about that. His name is still not known. He went anonymously with a, with a journalist from The Observer, but nothing else is known about that man. It was Reg Crew who opened the door that my brother could then peer through and see the light at the end of the tunnel to continue your analogy. And it was almost an, it, an immediate decision. He had just had the first of a 24 hour carers move into his home. And this poor woman within a couple of days of her arriving, John saying, not saying, cause he could no longer speak, but typing that he wanted to go to Dignitas and end his life. What she must have made of this, I don't know, but she was a wonderful, caring, kind, thoughtful person who was completely unfazed by anything, it turned out later. We got to know her better. And so, yes, it took two years, almost two years for John to, to go to find out about Dignitas and get there, but that's simply because nobody else knew about it at the time. He was only the seventh Briton to have their help. And it was soon after finding out about Reg that he thought, that's, that's what I want to do. It was his immediate reaction to finding out that it was a possible possibility. John, Reg died at the end of January. John became a member almost immediately and died at the end of May. Um, what are your impressions of Dignitas as an organisation and in terms of their staff members? And overall, are, are you pleased that your brother's end of life was the best in the circumstances? Yes, in the circumstances, it was the best it could have been. As it, assisted dying is still illegal here, even if he was dying now, he would still go to Dignitas because the alternative simply doesn't exist here. Dignitas is, a, you said, it's a marvellous organisation, David. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Very moral, very upright, um, very careful, very thoughtful, and certainly not provocative. They do not make, make people make precipitate decisions. In fact, if anything, they take decisions slowly to make sure that nobody feels rushed into, into Take, joining their act, their organisation or taking the next step. I have met, I've had the privilege of meeting um, Sil Ludwig Minelli when we went with John to Switzerland. Uh, I've met Sylvan a couple of times since then. Sylvan Lully is, is in, a, in a sense, his Dignitas second in command these days. Uh, they are wonderful people. All of the whole organisation is staffed by caring, kind, considerate, and above all, compassionate people. Um, I believe that the world would be a better place if they didn't exist, and I know that they believe that too, but that won't come about until the situation throughout the whole world has changed and everybody has a right to the, the simple end of life care that is our right as human beings. We should not be compelled to suffer as we are. Uh, Sorry. No, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, David has explained why this route is, is right for him, um, but people do still have concerns about it. One argument against a change in the law here is the provision of palliative care, and with the change of law, there would be less motivation to improve it. Is that something that has been seen in other countries? No, I don't believe it is. In the Netherlands, for instance, where um, euthanasia, which is a semantic issue we might be able to come back to later, where the law was changed quite some time ago, their palliative care system is regarded as the best in Europe, which suggests that the two can go hand in hand. And certainly that's been the case in Oregon, which is often, often looked at in America as being, if you like, the gold standard, 
simply because their law was the first to change in the states. They've got the best statistics to look at. But in Oregon, when the law was changed in the mid to late 1990s, the hospice movement there protested strongly, and wanted the law to be reversed. They said it was completely incompatible with the goals that they were look, looking to, to achieve. And they started a court case but because the wheels of justice in America run, eat, grind even more slowly than they do here in the UK, it took a very long time for that case to come to court. And by the time they were given permission to take the case and everything was ready, they actually, the whole hospice movement in Oregon actually decided not to press the case anyway, because they could see that what the way the law was working in practice was compatible, there was the assisted dying as it worked in Oregon was compatible with the hospice movement and there was no need to draw a line under, uh, to, to ban assisted dying or to try to separate the two, that they could work hand in hand. And that I believe is how things could work. There's a book called Hospice and Hemlock, which makes this point very clearly that there is no incompatibility between the two and they, that they should be allowed to work together. I think that's very a very um, it's a very hopeful sign for the future that Oregon dropped the case and that the Netherlands has such highly regarded palliative care. And um, like most things in life, finances often dictate choice. Um, one may want to live out their final days at home, but be un be unable to afford the care and support that that requires. Mm. Or may they want to they may want to avail of a hospice, but there aren't enough spaces. Um, the fear is they may end up in a dreadful care home or a hospital trolley in a corridor. Should these sort of issues be dealt with first or is it because of these issues that a change in legislation is so important? It's a very good question and it's one that um, I, I'm not, I don't feel qualified to answer but I can give you my, my opinion. I think we, we need to develop both approaches because palliative care cannot does not provide the answer for everybody at the moment. And I don't believe it ever will be able to provide the answer for everybody. People with motor neuron disease, like yourself, David, find some of the symptoms simply cannot be palliated. And one of the most important ones for my brother, and I believe possibly having heard your story, David, it might apply to you too, is the indignity of being what a Christian friend of mine called a living head on a dead body of being conscious, but incapable, not being able to communicate the thoughts that are trapped in your head. I think that was one of the things that my brother feared more than anything in the world, was not even being able to scratch his nose or tell somebody that his nose needed scratching. And palliative care can improve, it will improve, and it will become more available to more people, but it will never solve all the problems. So I don't think we need to put either on the back burner while we develop the other. I think they both need to be developed in tandem so that we can have good palliative care, we can offer assisted dying, and they can work together. Great. Um, and another fear is that people could make a snap decision to end their life, possibly even under duress. But it's, it's not like this is a quick process. I think you, you even mentioned this earlier. Maybe you can explain what an organization like Dig Dignitas requires before they allow someone to end their life there. David was very sensible to join Dignitas as soon as he did because it can be a very slow process. It can take up to six months for people's membership to be processed and approved. And that's just, was especially the case last year, of course, with, with the travel restrictions that applied, people were finding that they simply didn't have the, the opportunity to, to travel when they wanted, when they needed to. The process of applying starts with filling in the forms, supplying all the right paperwork, getting the approval from the doctor that you had the good fortune to meet in, in Zurich, David, mm -hmm. and then you go through the process of obtaining the green light. All of that takes an absolute minimum of three months and Dignitas, I believe, suggests that you leave six months. But it can be very hard to know when you need to start this process. And so applying as soon as you think you might need Dignitas's help is very, very sensible. You did exactly the right thing. For John, it only took three months. He was very keen to move quickly and Dignitas was a lot less busy then. There have been almost 500 British people who died at Dignitas since John. 
and there are far more members worldwide, there are far more people applying every day, every year the, at the moment to Dignitas. They are very slow and very careful and very cautious. So it is important to allow yourself plenty of time and not think at the last minute, this is what I want to do. There is no, you, it's not a last minute decision you can take. It is very, very, very careful. Thanks, Leslie. Um, time is getting away from us, but I think that, you know, you've answered some questions, our questions really well. Uh, I hope that's educated people who don't, haven't maybe ever thought about what assisted dying is, and, um, and maybe it can persuade people to help campaign for, for, some, for that change in, in their perspective com uh, countries as well. Um, uh, so th so thank, you, thank you for joining us uh, and, and, and explaining for all that for us. Um, but I, I must move on. Can I invite um, Tony Watts to talk about what he's been doing to raise money for the MNDA? We're going to spotlight Tony. I'm mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Like many, many other people, um, I've been deeply impressed and moved by the way in which David has dealt with this, what's happened, happening to him. Uh, right from the beginning, he was totally open and utterly clear about everything, which was a great gift, I felt, to me and many, many other people. And he's enabled us to learn an enormous amount. Um, and talking with David and with one or two others, we thought it would be great if we could set up a fund to encourage uh, uh, contributions to research in this field and we've heard uh, this afternoon about what is going on how important this research is so we have set up this fund in David's name um, and uh, there are two routes I mean one is that you can um, make, uh, give a donation uh, through the it's called the David Peace Much Loved um, address and Minji will be putting this up in a minute and that's a one-off payment, and we are absolutely thrilled for anything you can provide on that. But we're also rather keen to encourage people to give direct debits, because then you'll be giving a contribution every year for a number of years, hopefully. And uh, it, this, this work needs sustained support. So if you feel you can do that, you can do that through the MNDA's uh, own website. And if you do that, uh, you should indicate that uh, you would like your gift to be recorded as part of the fund. As Tim said earlier, we've now raised, I think it's, uh, it's, it's getting close, I think that 15,000 once one, one includes the direct debits. We would like it to get up to 20,000, 25,000. Many people when they've given their contributions have said some wonderful things to David um, about, uh, particularly about the blog, uh, which is a wonderful blog. It is wonderfully entertaining, uh, but also enormously informative. So it's a way of actually giving a tribute to David, which uh, he, richly richly deserves but also it's a way in which all the work that he has done to be open about all this can help research which will help people in the future hopefully to uh, to cope with and maybe even avoid this terrible terrible disease so please contribute if you can and also please tell your friends about it all this has been done so far through networking we've just passed the message around to people we know um, so if there are other people who you know who you think might be interested, please pass the information to them as well. And please make use of um, this session, which I think will be available, because I think it's been enormously uh, informative and helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, I've been running a little campaign alongside this as well. Uh, it works alongside and in tandem with the David Peace Fund that Tony was talking about. Um, and. Uh, I wanted to approach mine via social media and our inclination to share things online, which um, we all do so often. I set up, an, set up an initiative called the MND Art Challenge. The idea is to populate social media with photos of things you've made, things, things you're proud of, to raise a smile and to raise awareness of the disease. Um, it's for everyone, all ages, all skill sets, can be fun or serious. I'd like to encourage you all to post something creative to social media, a photograph, a song, a sketch, a cake, a craft, anything, anything you're proud of making, old or new. You can tag your post with the hashtag MND Art Challenge so we can see what you've made. Um, then you donate whatever you can via the Just Giving page set up for the campaign that Minji will link to in the chat box. And finally, you challenge, nominate or encourage five other friends to do the same. That way we're spreading the, spreading the campaign as far and wide as possible. I wanted to try to use the arts as a vehicle for uh, some positive change. 
to spread a few smiles along the way and raise some much needed funds. To kick off the campaign, I painted David's portrait, which you might have seen in the, in the um, advertising information for this talk. I'm not an artist, but in lockdown, I wanted to try to have a go at painting something, and I thought it would bring a bit of joy to David in these uh, difficult times. Um, I hope by sharing it, I can encourage others to take up the challenge, donate, and encourage others to do the same. Spreading this as far and wide as possible will increase the chances, chances of eventually finding a treatment for MND. All monies raised really do have a real world effect. If you are able to donate, whichever route you choose, the money ends up in the pockets of the MNDA and a record is kept via the David Beast Fund. Um, so I do hope in some way you're able to take part. Now, let me hand back to David for some final few words. Thanks, Tony and Tim. What you have achieved so far is already making a difference. The donations received are sent to the MNDA on a weekly basis, so we know that people are benefiting already. And thanks also to Brian and Leslie for contributing to this talk. In the relatively short time I have left, it is highly unlikely that the scientists will find a cure or an effective treatment. Broadly, in 100,000 people in any one year, about 440 will contract cancer, and just two will contract MND. In view of that, what commercial company would invest greatly in researching MND when there are so few sufferers? We desperately need money to stimulate research, to provide resources, and to raise the agenda. I will not benefit, but we must make sure that others will. It cannot continue like this. There must be answers. Please help. Um, well, thank mm. you, David. I think you've just said it best. Mm. Um, he's just pointing me. If there are any final questions bef just before we wrap up, can uh, you either put your hand up or, or write something in the chat just before we go? If, or if we've missed you, you know, say it again and then we'll, we'll come to you. Uh, there are a few questions from the chat box, if I may relay. Sure. Um, maybe, maybe you can invite them to, to ask, ask the question. Yes, so we've got a question from, I believe, let me, Maria. Maria, I wonder if you are still there. Marie Panani, Panayi. Okay, uh, she's asking, where was David born and where did he grow up? Um, he was born uh, in, uh, near Bournemouth or in Bournemouth and, but grew up uh, in Solihull, which is near Birmingham in the Midlands of the UK, Midlands of, the, of England. And I believe Joanna has a question as well. Joanna, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yes, so I was wondering, how do you come to terms with receiving such a, such a diagnosis? Like, you know, it's, it's terminal and because I, it's so hard to understand, like, I'm going to try my best to answer for David with his permission. Um, you know, I think when he got the diagnosis, he, he, he was very pragmatic, pragmatic about it and decided he knew what the outcome was, was going to be. Uh, he knew how he wanted to control the situation. So he had decided to, to join Dignitas, for instance. And in, in the 18 months since then, I think, you, you know, you just, you just take it day by day oh. and, take the challenge, challenges head on and, uh, and just try to overcome them. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think there's any real secret to it. Um, mm. He's just, he's just writing something. Mm. Mm. Um, he's just saying that, you know, at this point, he may have even gone to Dignitas already, but because of the pandemic, Mm. Um, Switzerland wasn't actually letting anyone in from the UK uh, up until the end of February, I believe. Um, so, mm. you know, mm. I, 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 it's it's difficult for me to say anything mm. else other than that. So I think uh, I think that's the mm. best answer I, we can give. Uh, 
and there's a, a, a guest called Luisa Lopes. I don't know if I pronounced your name right. If you if you are there, would you like to speak a few a few words? Ask your question. I think you've got the question, Luisa. Um, hello, my name is Luisa. Um, yes, means you pronounce it correctly. <laughs> um, I have a, an, an ask for David. Um, how did you felt when you found out about your disease? Was it, how, how did you felt? Mm, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's sort of similar to the, the last question. Um, you know, I think probably a, a little shock at first, um, but, but, but it was a sort of very, uh, um, very sort of tunnel vision approach. He, he, he uh, realized what the diagnosis was and he tried to figure out what was going to be the best outcome for him and the best way mm. to control the situation. So I don't think he panicked. Mm. It was um, a shock, mm. but he was able to, to, to take mm. it instead and deal with it. Mm. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for Brian and Leslie or Leslie before before we uh, before we wrap up? I just say something before before then. My brother's reaction to realizing he had MND was yes, it was going to end his life, but there was an awful lot of living to do before then. And he certainly got on and did that. He made most the most of the time he had available to him. And it pleases me greatly, David, that you're able to do things like this to make the most of the time that you have available to you too. It's really important that you that we do. We don't just give up on life. We may one day want to end it, but until that time, we live it to the full. I think that's very important. I think one hugely difficult thing about David's experience was um, COVID-19, which, you know, it's not unique for David. Everyone has been suffering through it. But um, when you when you have to be housebound for, for the best part of a year, when you you only have a year or, or, or a bit longer left, it's, it, you know, that I think is one of the most difficult things to, to, to navigate. Um, things like the blog, which I really do hope you all get to look at, um, have really sort of been an escape for, thing, for him, I think. He started it in April last year, and there's about 200 and almost 200 posts. Mm. Yeah, 200, 200 blog mm. updates, oh. almost. Um, so I think that's one of the ways he's been sort of living vicariously through, through a blog, um, because we haven't, he hasn't been able to go out so much. Anyway, yeah, Minji, I think over to you to, to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David and Tim and Tony, Leslie and Dr. Brian. It's been an absolute honor to have you. I'm eternally grateful. Uh, a little bit of history of our group. We started this group uh, last year during lockdown when we were trapped at home. This is rather an effort for us to look beyond and look ahead what's outside of our very limited physical space. Um, so Sunday, it's always a time for us to hear something inspiring, meet someone inspiring. Um, in a way, we are all travelers. Um, even we are confined at home, we are tra travelers to this world and we are travelers to this life. But it's very important not just to be a, a pure visitor. Um, we should all be very active participants. Just like what Leslie said, when we live our current life, live it to the full. Um, a Sunday like this make us to see things other people are seeing, hear stories other people are experiencing. It also encourage us to solve problems other people are facing. And that's... Um, that is how we actually, as a human race, advance and progress to discover unknown, keep on pushing our boundaries and uh, discovering unknown things. Again, many, many thanks to everybody who uh, attended today's session, to everybody who spoke at today's session. It's fascinating, it's engaging, it's inspiring. Uh, I will send a follow-up email soon, so uh, each of us today, if we want to provide, offer a help in the way we can, uh, the email will tell you what to do. So uh, finally, David very kindly recommend 
a song to end, complete our session today. So I'm just going to play the song as a way to um, thank everybody for coming and thank everybody for sharing a wonderful session and sharing a wonderful life. It's absolutely lovely. Thank you everybody for coming today and we will see you next week. Thank you very much.